Good afternoon. It's um, the Demolition News daily live stream, and it is now, blind me, episode 16. Um, who, th who would have thought we would have been going this long? Um, got a, a, a slight issue here in the uh, part of the... Ah, uh, that's more like it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm back with you now. Um, just to prove that we don't throw these shows together, uh, sporting a Caterpillar hat, 1925. Today is actually the 95th anniversary of Caterpillar, um, so... This is all part of the planning. I actually realised this five minutes before I came on here, so that's not strictly true, but you get the idea. Um, if you were watching yesterday, uh, you'll know that we paid tribute to uh, our friend um, Phil Jones from Volvo Construction Equipment. The response to that has been absolutely overwhelming. I must admit, I've been rather humbled from it, uh, by it because we, we had some messages in from his colleagues and also from his family as well. Obviously, I didn't do it for the, the thanks, just you know, saying goodbye to a, a, a friend of some long standing. But I'm, I'm very, very relieved that it's been received in the way that it was intended. I, 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 for my sins, I spent my life writing about factual things like demolition and diggers, and, and I don't generally get involved in anything with an, you know, an emotional bias to it. Um, and it's just a bit of a relief that I managed to get the tone more or less right on this instance. So uh, for all of those that have messaged me, thank you very much indeed. Now, speaking of the way I earn a living, part of the job of a trade journalist, I guess, is, is to we kind of scan the horizon to see which way the wind's blowing. Um, under normal circumstances, that tends to be fairly straightforward. You know, if, if there's a, a skill shortage, if there's a lot of machine purchases going through, if there's a willingness to spend more money on advertising and marketing, it's a fairly safe bet that things are going pretty well. Conversely, if there's a rise in the number of people that are looking for work, if there's cutbacks in marketing spend, that usually triggers my my spider senses to say there's a, a bit of concern and pessimism out there. But what are the runes saying now? I wish I knew. Uh, there are companies that responded to the initial COVID-19 uh, pandemic by closing, uh, closing sites and furloughing staff, but they've now, at least some of them, have at least partly gone back to work. At the same time, there were companies that fought desperately hard not to shut sites, but have this week joined the lockdown. If you follow uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and all these platforms, there seems to be a lot of talk at the moment, not great, no great surprise, about recession and economic meltdown. Yet last month, the BC Live League table of, of new contract awards recorded £8 billion worth of new business. And just this morning, we've, had, we've heard that... Um, some what, 12 billion pounds worth of new uh, HS2 contracts have been given the green light. I've got a funny feeling we may have actually frozen here, so bear with me if if I'm if I'm talking into the dark. Right, okay, looks like we're back on again. Um, I'm trying to get my head around exactly what the situation is, so I, I thought I'd, I'd bring on a, a guest who's watching this every bit as eagerly as I am. Um, Andy Hare. Um, he's today's guest. Uh, he works at, at the attachment specialist Northern Track. Um, he's a relatively small but very, very focused equipment manufacturer. So my guess is he scans the horizon even more thoroughly than me. Uh, he's also been very public in his frustration over the implementation of the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. And just last week, he was filmed for a forthcoming episode of the BBC's current, current affairs program, Panorama. So let's get Andy in the stream. So thanks for joining us, Andy. Um, no worries. Just to, to, to set the, the scene, because we have a, had a bit of a, a, an unplanned break there, you and I have got more in common than just our devilish good looks. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we, I, so. uh, I, started my, I started my business in June 1990. I think you're coming up to your 30th anniversary as well. It is our 30th anniversary on the 1st of July of this, uh, of this year, yes. Our business in June 1990. I think you were around about the same time. So we've yeah. both been our ups and downs but this one does feel very very different doesn't it this is completely different this is kind of unprecedented because it's i mean beyond global i think we're, we're just seeing that many countries have been affected and the difference in how everybody's been affected it's like complete shutdowns everywhere which we've never experienced you know recession is one thing this is something else now, you as a company deal with a, a lot of Italian manufacturers. Obviously, Italy was was hit very hard and very early, I think, in, in yep. the COVID-19 pandemic. How has that impacted your business, first and foremost? 
in in a sense it's helped me keep an eye on what's coming um it's not impacted in in an immediate sense because we we also manufacture so the 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 working with the italian companies as dealers and things and supplying equipment is one part of the business but obviously the majority for us is manufacture here in the uk but it's allowed me to actually sort of um see what's going on and what's coming in advance by talking to my friends in italy and being aware of how early businesses over there were closing down and just giving me a handle on how bad it really was and what was likely to come you know it was it was kind of an insight as to where we were going to end up yeah it's interesting because i mean certainly the, the very reason that i started these daily live streams was as a result of of speaking to one of the uh, italian contractors who's, who's a friend of mine and you know, I'd, I'd obviously seen what was coming out of, of China and, and, you know, other places. But he's, the conversation I had with him was what really hit hit the message home and made me realise just how serious this this could potentially be. And I, I think that's that's now played out, hasn't it? Uh, definitely. And I mean, we I think it's a problem that people are not realising just how serious it is. You know, we've had we've had the sunbathers in the park and the you know the people nipping off to the lakes for a canoe session, and it's like get a grip people this is real you know people are dying out there and we are all supposed to be in this together and we're supposed to be doing it you know we're supposed to be keeping safe now obviously you've mentioned the fact that you're a manufacturer and you're a very sort of focused manufacturer sort of operating in a fairly small niche what actions have you taken personally to, to protect your business you know have you furloughed staff or, or what have you I mean, done it, it, initially we got involved and looked at the the sort of furlough scheme the problem i've got with the three guys that work in a workshop particularly they all have sort of individual sort of personal reasons why we need to help them keep safe you know be it child care issues be it health issues be it being a carer for somebody else so it's kind of i had to take a decision just that in the week prior to the major lockdown and say look you know this is not going to work for us all um although three guys in a workshop we can sort of keep apart from each other. It doesn't work. You've got to work together. You've got to get a cup of tea. You've got to sit down in a canteen. You've got jobs where you need to collaborate. So it's kind of, no, it's, it's, it's not safe. I can see what's going on abroad. I can see what's happening in Italy. I'm not going to be the one that's going to not heed the advice and go, you know, oh, it's, it's fine. It'll just blow over. It's nothing. It is something. So I made the decision and we sort of, we, we kind of bailed out and closed down early. At the time, we were, you know, finding suppliers and things were doing similar, and it was getting to be difficult. And I've mentioned previously, you've been—I was going to say fairly vocal, but you've been very vocal about <laughs> your fr frustrations with this um, coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. Uh, what is yes, what the mouthful I've, that is? Um, yeah. Have you been told that you qualify for the loan? And, and, and if so, you know, what, what is the problem? What, what are the, the, the issues really? that are facing you? The, the the problem the problem with the loan is I mean obviously we like a lot of businesses are looking for cash flow short term the problem is we've furloughed staff which is great okay you can get eighty percent of salary and you can pay the guys it's not ideal you know we'd like to have them working we'd like to be paying them but we can take advantage of that scheme but it's a scheme that as yet only exists on paper you know we we're being told that we can sign people up from Monday and you know we'll be able to get the money back possibly within four to six days thereafter but. Uh, what can I say? It's, it's a technical thing. We're going to sign up people to a portal that's online to the HM Revenue. And there are something like nine to 10 million employees' names that have to go on this list so far. Do you honestly think that scheme is going to hit the ground running on Monday and work and not crash? I'm not convinced. If I could get a bet on it, I would bet against it. So it's one thing that's coming up. But in the meantime, like other businesses that are furloughing way more staff than we are, um, you've got to finance supplier payments you've got financial salaries you've got uh, utility bills coming in and it's the cash flow issues and for us obviously as a manufacturer we are that little bit niche we have a particular product the selector grabs that we manufacture and sell that we make so we're actually supplying what is effectively capital equipment and it's kind of things where it's not something that a guy is going to nip in and sort of bob and bobby's head around the door and go i'll take two of those and you go yep yeah, that's 20 grand please these are considered purchases and when things get rough and times like this, when people are preserving cash flow, the first thing they're not doing is rushing out and buying nice new shiny diggers and nice new shiny attachments to put on the end of them. Simple as. No, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that struck me about this, and I, I mean, I, I'm going through the same process because I'm self-employed. So, you know, I, I'm waiting for the arrival of a, of a different portal, but, you know, same sort of circumstances. Yeah, exactly. Um, but one of the things that struck me about all of this is the fact that I, I think the government... In fairness, I think the government 
by and large, has, has acted appropriately. And you know, I, I, I have my my personal beliefs on that. But they garnered a, an awful lot of very very positive PR and publicity yeah. on the basis that they were sort of swing swinging to the rescue of. of Businesses like yours and like mine, and yet the the actual practicalities that doesn't seem to be the case, does it? It's it's not happened. We we sat there, you know. Rishi Rishi Sunak popped up, uh, new guy on the block. We'd not seen him, not heard of him, but he came out and he put on a fantastic show. He opened the purse strings and said, "Here we go. We've got three hundred and fifty billion pound package that we're putting together for business, for self employed, for the retail, hospitality, leisure. You name it. I am pouring money into it." Part of that was 330 billion pounds of loan guarantees for small businesses. And it's just not happening. The problem we've got is this 330 billion pounds worth of guarantees is like an 80% guarantee. And it's a scheme that's been cobbled together. It's been cobbled together on top of an existing enterprise finance guaranteeing scheme, which in itself, I think over the past 10 years, had only managed to dish out a meagre amount of funds comparatively to about 35,000 businesses. And at the moment, the last sort of um, figures that we were getting were there were at least 300,000 applications for the C-Bills loan, as we've now dubbed it. And out of that, as of today, Rishi Sunak is apparently crowing to us all that he's doing really fantastically now because 6,000 companies have managed to access that. So 2%, 2%. And we've not got valid figures. We've not got figures of who's actually been, been declined it. Hand up, I've been declined. I've approached my bank, Lloyd's Bank, and it took them two weeks to take a look at anything. It took me best part of a day to get on their website, which had crashed multiple times to fill in their application. It took a week for my relationship manager to even ring me back. That was a shocker to me. Relationship manager, who the hell are you? I've never seen you. I've never heard of you. Where have you popped up from? Well, magic anyway, right? You're a relationship manager. Sounds good. It's a wonderful title. You're going to help me. Crack on and help me. Nothing. A week later, sat on the sofa, having submitted all sorts of, you know, the usual documentation to try and get into this scheme because at the end of the day, the scheme involves the bank only getting an 80% guarantee from the government. And that's where it's falling down. The bank is looking for a guarantee for the other 20%. And banks are banks. They're not going to give money away with the even vaguest possibility they're going to lose it. And they're certainly not going to step up to the plate now and bail out small businesses. And this is the crux of the problem with the loan. The money's not getting out there. And I heard a really good analogy somebody did online. and said, basically, businesses are on fire. They are burning. Businesses are burning, crumbling to the ground. And the government has said, right, quick. Here's a fire engine, get the fire engines out there. And the fire engines have raced to the scene of the businesses and they've reeled out the hoses and given them to the bankers. And the bankers have gone, what are these? What do we do with these? Oh, what do we do with this? And everybody behind there and in the business area screaming, for sake, turn on the water and actually lend funds because that's what's going to save people. And it's, it's kind of, we're in this situation where under normal circumstances, we wouldn't all be asking for loans. We are being forced into taking on debt to keep our businesses going, which are closed through no fault of our own, through a worldwide pandemic, something that we've got no control over, but something that the government is saying to us, look, stay safe, stay home. You've got to do this for us. We've got to protect the NHS. And we're out there. We businesses are stepping up and going, right, we're doing this, you know. And I'm talking to that many people on Twitter. It's unbelievable. I'm talking to people who are way worse than I am. I'm talking to businesses that, you know, are standing behind £100,000 a month of expenditure and nothing coming in. You know, one particular um, guy that we're speaking to is a pub down in Oxford. There are that many of us speaking to these people. We've all actually said, look, if we all get out of this the other side, we're all coming down to Oxford because we're going to go and we're going to have a meal at your pub. And we're looking, you know, even just for an outing. But he he, he was eligible as a, a retail, leisure, hospitality business, as I understand it, for a £10,000 grant. Brilliant. He burnt through that in three days. And he's got nowhere. You know, people are not actually getting any success with the banks. The banks are sat there and they're going through the motions. They're actually going through their normal procedures of lending. <coughs> because it's, it's, you know, it's this commercial risk to them. They've, they've got a 20% chance that they're not going to get all the money back. And banks being banks, they want the pound of flesh. 
every single time. And that's where the problem lies. You know, we, we, we're all sort of sat on Twitter and we're looking at the scheme that's um, in Switzerland. And we're all thinking, my God, it must be wonderful to live in Switzerland. The scheme was launched in Switzerland. Straight away, the actual government stepped up and said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to allow you 10% loan based on your turnover, up to a maximum of £400,000 there, thereabouts. And that loan is going to be at 0% interest. Wow. Now that's stepping up. And if you need some more money than that, if you're a bigger business, fair play, and that £400,000 isn't enough, well, whatever you want above that, 85% of that we're going to lend you. Um, we're going to guarantee that, and we're going to step up, and we're going to say, well, uh, half a percent interest. Wow. Yeah, half a percent. Brilliant. Anything after that, the bank can get a little bit. <laughs> but it's kind of like the money there in Switzerland, the, the, there were people applying for loans on the Friday, and the money was in the account on Monday. Businesses are surviving because the Swiss government has stepped up and said, look, this is what we've got to do. And our government is kind of sat back and said, look, what we're bothered about is fraud. We're really scared of fraud, you know, forgetting all the fact that, you know, all the fraud that went on in the banking sector when it all went to pot, you know, not that many years ago when we were underwriting the banks and bailing them out for billions within days. The banks don't want to step up and do the same. The only way that the banks will step up and do the same and the only way of allowing money into this system whereby more lenders can get on board, like the fintech type lenders, you know, the, the technology lenders that are actually um, technology based and don't have all the paper and all the crap behind them to actually wade through is to, to get the government to step up and go, look, right, we're going to stand behind this 100 percent. And we were all we were kind of sitting there yesterday when Rishi Sunak popped up. It's like as soon as his name appears in the daily briefing, everybody's like, wow, here we go. This is it. We might get something. We might hear something. Yeah, he might actually get involved and straight away we listened to him and finally somebody did ask him the question you know we, we were waiting and waiting for somebody to ask a relevant question instead of instead of some of the rubbish that they keep asking or like oh when are we going to be released from lockdown look mate it's not going to happen we all know this right ask about the loan system and say yeah so somebody actually asked him the question and said look switzerland 100 percent. are you going to do it and he just backpedaled and backpedaled and all he's bothered about is the chance that somebody somewhere might defraud them you know in the us they're doing a similar system and guaranteeing loans for 100 percent, and they've kind of built in a margin of fraud thinking that yeah they're going to get some but when you actually quantify the amount that's going to go out in terms of fraud that they're not going to get back and the collapse of so many businesses and so many people being unemployed you've got to ask is it worth it and i think it is but the government doesn't seem to think so Sorry, for no, that's how no, no. I, I, I mean, you, you're obviously very passionate about the, the, the subject, and, and rightly so. To, to, to make sure that I understand the situation, I, I mean, obviously, the, the government is the ultimate power here, but this does feel very much like it's you know they've been told what to do, but it's the actually the point of delivery, i.e., the banks that are yeah. querying the pitch here. The banks is basically it's, it's almost like a funnel, and the banks are at the end, and they're you know, as I say, going back to the hose analogy, they're the ones that have got control of the tap ultimately. And it's that control that needs to be taken away. Or we need a system whereby they say, look, if they were to actually guarantee to a tune of 100 percent, then the banks will think, yeah, well, no problem. We're OK. We're safe. We can turn on the tap. But it's also the banks, because they've still got this 20 percent that they've got to um, protect, as were, you know, as it were, they're still going through their old fashioned paper systems. They're looking at you and they're looking at the bottom line. And in, in our case, yeah, hold my hand up. The, um, the accounts figures, net figures for the last couple of three years, we have a net loss. And that's why we've been refused. Simple as. Now, there's no actual bank manager to speak to and say, well, why did you have a net loss? Was it because you moved premises in 2015? Was it because you invested £70,000 in a new plasma cutter? Was it because you invested in a new overhead traveling crane for the workshop? Have you spent money? Have you invested like you have over 30 years? Which we have done. You know, businesses out there and especially limited companies know full well that, you know, there's no there's no sort of praise for being a massive um, profit every year and showing a profit every year. It doesn't work like that. You know, it, it's not that case. But the problem is the banks are just looking. They've, they've obviously got a mountain of applications for these loans and they're looking there and going, ah, 
oh, have a look at the figures. Oh, we can see a loss there. Right, cross that one off, chuck it on the dumb pile. And that's how it is. Whereas, you know, the, the going through it in a paper fashion, we, we don't need it. The, the Swiss system, we keep coming back to it, but that's the one that we all like because we'd all actually get some money out of it. The Swiss system is basically a one-page A4 form and a declaration virtually. And it's based on information that the revenue has and the government has from turnover of business. So uh, it's difficult to actually physically defraud it, but still it can be done online within minutes. And in instances like that, the money is literally there within two days. And that's what's saving businesses in Switzerland. We're not doing it. We're not saving businesses in the country. We're actually leaving it and just saying, well, you know, the banks will sort it out. They'll do it. Yeah, they'll get through. And it's not happening. The banks are not stepping up when we need them to step up. They're just sitting back as per usual and doing what banks do, protecting their own interests, protecting the shareholders, not stepping up, not doing what we need. You know, we're not all in it together with the banks. The banks are in it as usual for themselves. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's doubly frustrating, really, isn't it? Because, you know, it's only a decade ago that we we as a nation bailed out the banks. Um, <laughs> and, and, and this idea of, you know, trying to, to use tried and tested formulas and, and that kind of thing. You know, yeah. we, we don't live in that we're world. Not, we're not moment. in that territory. That That is the yeah. problem. We are not in that territory. Banks are working on old models. They're working with an old enterprise finance guarantee scheme that's being cobbled on top of. These are not the same times. We've not experienced anything like this before ever and we need action that reflects that and they've got to step up they've got to actually get in there and get involved but obviously the government has got to free the shackles they've got to change the system and they've got to allow some of the other lenders to get on board now uh, you know they say that the biggest problem with this loan is um there are over 40 different lenders on the panel that you can approach now when you look at that firstly you're obviously inclined to choose your own bank you know, you've got a relationship or a relationship manager, in fact, even though you've never met him. Um, so you approach your own bank thinking that they're going to be the best part of call. You get declined. Oh, right. Well, there's a, they keep telling me there's 40 other lenders. Yeah, but you can't get an application into them. You click on that West and go in there and think, right, I'll apply for this C-Bill coronavirus business interruption loan. You go through all of the website. And when it comes to apply, it says, oh, thank you very much. NatWest is here to help you um, at the moment. We are concentrating on helping our own customers because basically we have got a whole shed load of those to go through before we are even going to start to get to look at you. And that happens at every, every juncture. You keep going through to a different lender. And, you know, I've tried to agree so you get the same answer to the extent where you think, well, what is the point of this? You know, what is the point of actually getting involved and trying to apply to yet another lender, trying to supply figures? which in itself is a joke. You know, you, there are there are people out there already sort of advertising, oh, we can help you out. We can do this. We can do that. Uh, one of those, just, just for a laugh, that was like, oh, we can do it. I had a look at their application criteria and straight away they asked for cash flow forecasts. Okay, fair enough. For 2020. Okay. And 2021. You were having a laugh. How can you even make a cash flow forecast for the next three months? when you don't know when this is going to finish, you don't know when this is going to end. How, how can you make a cash flow forecast? I remember putting a comment on one of these things and going, yeah, unfortunately, I can't apply with you because I don't have Nostradamus on my accounting panel. Simple as. Yeah. You, you've mentioned the term a couple of times, uh, we're all in this together, and I know you did it very subtly in, in inverted commas. Are we? Are you being paid by customers? Because I, I, I mean, I, certainly from my point of view, and I'm not going to ask you to name and shame, but from my point of view, I am unpaid in seven weeks now. Literally, not had a dime through the door. Um, are you get, still getting money through the door? At, at this moment in time, we kind of, it's kind of strange for us in that, um, yes, we have been. I, we're, we're in that situation where, as a manufacturing company supplying a piece of capital equipment, we tend to get paid when we're selling the equipment. And apart from sort of bigger outfits, bigger dealers. The majority of things, you know, people will be financing things, so you get money from finance. So although spares business and smaller bits, it's not quite the same. So we have outstanding accounts. On on the whole, money has come in for what we've got, but then it has dried up for us. But, the, you know, the other accounts that we are chasing, all, all I could say is, is to people out there in this situation, do the same as I'm trying to do with my suppliers and things, is to keep talking to people. I think if you actually talk to a, a customer, you talk to a supplier and say, look, this is what's happening. 
this is the position I'm in. I may not be able to do this now, but I, I'm, I'm not going to dump on you. I'm doing my best. And I think honesty, honesty is important. You've got to, you've got to tell people how it is at the moment. You know, I've done it today in emails to suppliers and things and said the same. You know, we're, we're trying. We're out there trying to make sure the cash flow, cash flow is there. But obviously, short term, the same as everybody, everybody's fighting the immediate fires. One of those is to protect your workforce as best you can because you're paying that money out and you're not seeing the furlough money come back. The same way that you've got to pay, you know, for us, it's the rates bill. You know, great. We, we're, we're not a big business. Three guys working in a workshop. Because of the size of the workshop, because we've got engineering machinery in it, we have a rateable value that's like well in excess of 30 grand a year. We're not a retail business. We're not a hospitality business. We're not a leisure business, although I think maybe pole dancing around selector grabs, it could have a future if we could get a grant for it, but we can't get a grant for it, you know. So we don't qualify. I mean, yesterday Rishi was saying, you know, he's helping everybody with, with direct help and direct cash. No, he's not. There are plenty of businesses just like us who are, everybody says falling through the cracks but my god these cracks are the size of the grand canyon they are not cracks it's the same you know in in respect of um the furlough scheme it's okay for the employees but for me personally if we're not selling anything i'm not getting anything the same as yourself if you're not actually you know out there earning it you're not getting it i as a director can furlough myself oh fantastic so I can furlough myself and then anything that I get is based on my PAYE salary. Every single limited company director out there knows full well that my PAYE salary is not my salary. We have a business. We extract money from a business when we can with dividends because it's tax efficient. It's the best way of doing it. It's not illegal. People seem to get on the high horse and it's like, oh, you, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. No, it's a legal system. Um, you know, other times I'm putting money back into my business, the same as everybody else. I'm entitled to draw money from it. You know, I'm entitled to get the fruits of it when it's there. But when it's not there and times get rough, we have to do what everybody does. But we can't, we, you know, I, I, I furlough myself and then I'm in the ridiculous situation where apparently once I'm furloughed as a director, I can no longer work for my business. I can't do anything for it and I can't generate revenue. So what? It's going to go up the wall and everything's in the shit just because I can no longer actually, you know, work for my business. This is the business I'm trying to save, trying to get funds for, trying to keep guys in work, trying to pay suppliers, trying to pay Leeds City Council 1,600 quid this month for some rent, uh, some rates rather, that they're going to be chasing for. Um, and then it, it goes on from there. But then, you know, I, I've become an expert in things that I never thought I would be. You know, as soon as he said that, oh, a director can furlough himself, I was already on it. I'd already said that to uh, to Sue two or three days mm. before and said, no, 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 I think I, I can furlough based on that. Then everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Yep, proved right. But when you look further into it, the Companies Act 2006, we're all supposed to know it as directors. You know, when you made your limited company, you signed up to all these little covenants of uh, being a director and saying, what are you going to do? And Section 172 is a winner. I recommend you read it, section 172. You've got to act in the best interests of your business at all times. You've got to foster relationships with your customers and your suppliers, and you've got to look after the interests of that business. Well, damn me if that's not working. And that's a statutory requirement. So you're saying I can't work, but then you're saying I have to fulfill my statutory uh, duties as a director. Well, on the other hand, then it looks to me like you can take me to court then because it looks like I can work and furlough myself. We'll see. The crazy thing with all of this is we, we seem to be in this really strange position at the moment. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. A lot, you know, we could do with some clarity and, and, and obviously some, some finance coming in. And yet this, there does seem to be an enormous amount of promise for post-COVID. You know, I, I reported £8.2 billion worth of, of new contract awards in March. The HS2 has been given the green light on £12 billion worth of work today. You know, yeah. if if you and I and others like us can make it through to the end of this, there, there, there is a pent up demand there. You know, it, it could it was, actually be a, a really good period for us. We've 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 kind of all been here before. You know what I mean? We've we've been through recessions and the like before. There's no doubt that we're heading for a recession. Nobody wants to talk into it or talk it up or do anything, but we know it's coming. All this money that we're paying out, we know we're going to be paying it back. 
we know full well that taxes are going to rise. You know, we know full well that uh, you know self-employed people are no longer going to be paying nine percent on the national insurance. It's going to go up to twelve, like everybody else. Things will change, but it's not a time we we can't sort of. There's no point. Okay, the money's been allocated for HS2, and people are running around. Oh, we need that money. We shouldn't be spending that. Yes, we should. That money needs to be spent, and the reason that money needs to be spent is kind of twofold. Number one, we need the infrastructure. We need HS2. Might be controversial to say it, but we do. There's no point not having it. Everybody's sort of like, oh, uh, yeah, but uh, it doesn't don't matter to me if I can get to London 15 minutes faster. That's no bloody good. I can't get down the road. Yeah, that's the problem. The railway structure as it stands at this minute cannot cope with the demand. Freight traffic that ought to be going by rail can't go by rail because capacity on our old network is not there. If we move high-speed rail onto a dedicated network, it frees up space for freight traffic and local passenger traffic to trundle about and more of it to do it. So from a, from a standpoint of physical infrastructure, it gets wagons off the road. It frees up the road. I mean, I, a few times I've driven to work, I've, I've thought, my God, I bet all the wagon drivers this past two weeks have been thinking, this is a wonderful life because the roads have been so quiet. It must be so nice to be a wagon driver and just be trundling around, not stuck in a traffic jam. But the, the HS2 project needs to go ahead then also because we need to get people back to work. The investment is coming from government. The money is coming into the country. It's supporting jobs. It's supporting British companies and it's supporting the supply chain all the way down. It's trickling down. And that, that money needs to get out there. We've got to spend it. We've got to improve the infrastructure. We can't carry on, but we need to invest. So we've got to get out there and carry on and get the businesses. And it's one of the things that will drive people back and get construction going again, demolition potentially getting going again, and it will keep the cogs turning. We need to do that. We, you know, we've got to we've got to get out of this. And that's one of the ways of doing it. So every every recession ends and, you know, we turn a corner and we get back again. But it's how we do it. And personally, I think this one could take a little bit of time because we're going to lose a lot of people along the way. Certainly if the funds are not coming and the tap's not turned on there. But at the moment, they've got to look at continuing these infrastructure projects because that is is government money that is coming out. It's just the same as lending money to retail, hospitality and leisure businesses. It's investing in, in infrastructure and keeping companies going, keeping them in work, keeping them paying their employees. Their employees are paying tax and national insurance and it's going back into the system. So it's perfectly right to do it. It has to continue. And yeah, OK, I think what is it now? We're going to be 100 percent of GDP effectively mortgaged going into the next year. So be it. You know, every other country is in a similar situation. Why should we be any different? We've got to step up. And we've got to get money out there and we've got to keep business going. Absolutely. Andy, look, I've, I've already taken up enough of your time. Now, I wouldn't normally no do this, but while we've been talking, we've had a, a couple of comments coming in. Um, I, you feel free to, to blush as you see fit. Um, we've had one here from Nick Drew over at the Digger Man blog. Uh, all the best, Andy, and a couple of thumbs up. Uh, another one here from uh, Louise Carney, obviously one of the faces behind Plantworks. Uh, hi, Andy, good to see you. Wish it was under better circumstances. Best of luck, mate. Um, and one from uh, Stephen McCann at That's Fourth cool. Demolition, or as was, uh, give my best wishes to Andy, such a gentleman. As is You've Steve. obviously got a lot of friends in the industry, Andy, so, you know, I, I, and I, I'd like to consider myself a, among them. So you know, when Indeed. all this blows over, I hope you and I can actually get back together again and, and have a coffee and laugh at what's just all gone on. Hopefully, hopefully. Fingers crossed. I'll keep my fingers crossed. And, and, and good luck with the loan scheme. And, no you know, try, try not to get too frustrated. I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers, Mark. Cheers. Right, my apologies for the uh, the technical issues. Thankfully, well, not thankfully, it doesn't make any difference, but at least one of them wasn't at my end. Um, we're we're going to sign off in a second. Um, I'm sure Andy's relieved to get be get back to the day job. Um, going to just end in the, the usual way, really. Um, I, I I think one of the things that, that's that's becoming clear to me here as I as I do these things is the importance of you know, hunkering down and, and, and really preparing. I, I think the fact that, that Andy is obviously preparing his business for, for what's to come. You know, I've spoken to a lot of companies over the past few days, you know, the, the ones that are, you know, investing in new systems, investing in training, looking at doing things in a different way. 
because as as I've already said, there's a, a huge potential for workload out there once this is all blown over. It's going to be the smart ones that are still there and and have taken the time to to recalibrate and to reboot and to rethink the way they do things. Those are going to be the guys that that really prosper, I think. Um, usual ending, as always. My apologies uh, for the technical di- issues today, um, but th- thanks for watching. Uh, stay safe. Look after yourself. Look after your family. Look after your friends. Look after your colleagues. I will see you again at three o'clock tomorrow uh hopefully with a slightly clearer internet connection thanks for watching and thanks andy for taking part all the best